I'm arguing for is different from uh, probably the mainstream of cognitive science. And the reason that the mainstream of cognitive science tend to think about uh, consciousness computationally. And so when you think about consciousness computationally, you have a natural uh, affinity with the gatekeeper view because we're just talking about how the brain computes object, right? Now, I'm going to argue for a different view, which is what I call the phenomenal field view, which is that actually, no, we should not understand consciousness computationally, that understanding consciousness computationally is obviously important, but is not able to get to what consciousness is, and that we will need something else to understand consciousness. Now, this is a thesis, this is a hypothesis, this is a view. It could be completely wrong, and the gatekeeper view, which is the mainstream of cognitive science, could be actually right. So I'm not saying that my view is right and this is wrong. I'm laying out two views, and then in the next few classes, I'm going to explore this second view, which is a view shared by uh, phenomenology and by a lot of Buddhist material, right? But you're absolutely right that uh, you shouldn't think that this is what the mainstream of cognitive science say. Mainstream of cognitive science is pretty comfortable with this gatekeeper view because it loves to think about consciousness computationally. Now, I personally don't think it's going to work, but who knows, right? So we're not going to know, but we at least need to think about the two possibilities, right? But thanks for your question, because actually this is what I'm trying to do today, is lay out what the problem of consciousness is, right? And one uh, important trend in com in uh, cognitive science would say, there is no problem. You, we just need to deal with computational, right? Meaning we just need to build model, computational model of human cognition, and that's how we'll understand consciousness, right? The second view argues that no. You may be able to think computationally about cognitive cognitions, particular cognitive events that you can model in a computer very well, but that's probably not going to explain consciousness because in a way, uh, what you want to argue is that consciousness has to be explained biologically rather than computationally. Because if you think about uh, the brain, uh, it's probably the brain we don't know, but it's probably not working like a computer, at least for the most part. It's probably working differently, and maybe some ideas in phenomenology will help us to try to get a handle on how the brain is different from a computer. But we have these two views, right? Yeah? Could you just define what perceptual processing means in that What's that? Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, let's take vision, right? Uh, we have pretty good models of how vision works. Now I want to insist on the, work, on the word model. Okay, these models, how they work? Well, as you know, in the eyes we have a series of cells which are specialized to grasp various uh, shapes, colors, and so on, right? And so all these cells do they work separately, and then what is happening is that this separate information are gradually integrated uh, by the brain, right? Now, so it goes from separate features to unified features to objects to categories. So, for example, it goes from uh, shapes, 
well, the separate uh, cells in the eyes, to shapes and colors, to object, to chair, right? So this is part of the biological... Well, <laughs> yeah, so this is processing, right? Now, uh, this is a model that we have, pretty good model, to which extent we understand it neurally or neurologically, that's a different question, right? There we have strong elements that support this model, but when you hear, when you read in the literature that the brain computes and so on, you should always understand that what they're talking about is a model of what the brain does, because we don't know whether the brain computes or not. And the reason we don't know is that we don't know how the brain handles memory. So as long as we don't know how the brain handles memory, there is no way we can really know whether the brain computes or not, right? But in the absence of a detailed knowledge of the brain, we, we have models and these models really work. They help us to understand what's going on. And so that's an excellent model of what we mean by perceptual processing, right? So, as you see, uh, a lot of this is going, is unconscious. By unconscious, I mean non-conscious, right? We, we are not aware of, separately, of color and shapes. And then, at a certain level, it becomes conscious, right? So, for example, here, at the level of objects, I would argue, it becomes conscious, right? Before we do the categorizing, right? That at least, I think, how I understand this threefold model. Yeah? Does this have anything to do with uh, the five aggregates? No. I'm not going to talk really about the five aggregates here. I mean, there is, uh, we, we can talk a little bit about when we talk about phenomenology. I'm mostly going to talk about ideas coming from Yogacara traditions such as Alaya Vijnana, uh, self-awareness, Vasamviti, and so on, which are found in uh, maybe slightly later. Uh, but, well, actually, we will talk about some of the aggregates because feelings is going to be extremely important, but we are not there yet. Yeah. So, what I am laying out today is the problem of consciousness, and I am laying out these two views, which uh, we call the uh, gatekeeper view and the phenomenal field view, right? Okay, a few more things to say. If we, yes? Can we say that this distinction is similar to talking about consciousness with an object or consciousness without an object? No, it's more understanding of the relation between consciousness and attention. But you're right that in the first view, it's not clear what consciousness without an object would be spelled out, right? Yes. So. The second view. You can have consciousness. Yes, at least, arguably, yeah. yeah. Well, objects would pass in and out of the consciousness. Well, or you have, in your third level of mindfulness, you have just mind looking at itself, right? Well, that would be what he said, the first one, that consciousness no. without an object. In the, in the third level of mindfulness, you have just consciousness. Without an object. Yeah. And that makes total sense in that view. In that view, it's a bit more difficult to spell out. This is why meditation is an interesting lab experiment for consciousness. Right? Now, if we take the second view, if we take the first view, it's pretty clear what the criteria is for what, we are, what is in consciousness. What is in consciousness is what we attend to, right? Right? Okay? okay. Yeah. But if we go to the second view, less clear, right? What is the criteria for something being in consciousness? 
If we hold the overflow view, meaning that there is more to consciousness than what we attend to, what's the criteria for what is in consciousness or not? Can we say self-referential? Well, what do you mean? Well, to be conscious, it has to uh, infer or represent itself to a self, to a being. Mm. Like a, the camera here is not conscious of you, but mm. I am. Yes. To a, to a self. But, but, okay, let me take another interesting case. One of the way we uh, people nowadays study consciousness is by looking at all the pathologies that can happen uh, to the brain and to cognition. Uh, one is called blind sight. Have you heard? It's an interesting case. Blind sight is a case of people who uh, have had a, a cardiovascular accident and therefore are impaired in their sight. Now, are they completely blind? No. They claim to be blind, but actually, if we make a, an obstacle, if we ask them, do you see? They will say, no, I don't see anything. But if we make an obstacle course, they will be able to navigate this obstacle course relatively well. Or if we ask them, like if we have a color, like a big patch of blue, and we ask them, what is this color? They will say, I don't know. And if we ask them, you have to make a choice, at about 80%, they will choose blue. So well over chances, right? What do we make of this case? Interesting, right? Blind sight. See, the camera is seeing, but it's not... No, and the camera is not seeing. Seeing. Well, the camera is maybe processing information. So yes. in the person, the camera part of the brain is seeing, but it's not referring to that self. So they can't say, I can see it. We'll talk about self later. But in this case of blind sight, is the stimulus in consciousness or not? So, what? There is perception, something. There is some level of perceptual process, processing, right? Right? Isn't it just that the, maybe the threshold has changed? So, just like you don't see shapes and colors, that some, somewhere in their brain, their threshold. So, uh, what do you mean, threshold? So, we, as you said, we don't see shapes and colors. You, you mean separately? Separately? Yeah. So, perhaps this mechanism. But do they see the objects or not? Well, if you ask them to guess a color, they guess a color right. So it's not just the obstacle course, which you're right, you, you might have a kind of kinesthetic dimension. But if you ask them to guess a color, if it's a big patch of color, they will guess at about 80% right. So, is color in their consciousness or not? Clearly, they are not able to attend to it because they claim not to see, right? And we have to take them at face value and assume that they are not lying. Blindsight is a condition, very unfortunate condition, that has been reproduced a number of times, so this is not a unique case. Yes? The what? Yes. 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 So that's like an inattentional attention. Well, they, they're able to pay attention to something, but they're not able to pay attention to the visual processing 
or, or maybe that's what it looks like, because I, I don't have the answer. And as far as I know the literature, people wonder what is really going on. Another interesting uh, case is what's called hemineglect, in which people see only half of the visual field. This is also after a cardiovascular event, uh, and they see only half of the visual field. So if you have two houses, one is on fire, the other is not on fire, they will see only, suppose they see only on the right, they will see only the right, the house on the right. Yet if you ask, if you ask them, do you want to go into the house on the left, they will say no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so here's a couple of ideas. What is, what, what's a criteria defining consciousness? In that view, in the second view? Well, it's not just attention, right? So maybe recall? And when people ask, what about forced choices? Is, does that, is that an indication that this is in consciousness, but maybe people are not able to attend to that fully? So is that different awareness of consciousness that are, are different? It's not, they're not equivalent. No, they're not equivalent. I'm not sure yet how to use the term awareness. But you could say that the person is unaware of the house on the left. But is in the consciousness. Okay, I, I like that. That's, I mean, you know, I'm committed to this view. This is a view that I'm going to explore. So that, that way of putting things works really well with that view because yes, you are unaware of the, the fire because you're unable to attend to the fire. And nevertheless, maybe the fire, the house on fire is in your consciousness in some way, right? And then think back to the gorilla. Right? Is it in consciousness or not? I would say no, but it's not obvious. I mean, it's like, you know, like the greenhouse in the video, like, it should hit my, my face, right? I mean, this kind of bright green, and yet I didn't see it at all, right? Was it in my consciousness or not? <laughs> So, Mark, Mark Rowlands, he, one of the cognitive scientists, talks about uh, personal cognition that is something that's represented to the person, mm -hmm. and subpersonal cognition, which is things that one cognizes or computes, but are not reported directly to consciousness. For example, if you have a, lit, a beam of wood, you naturally compute that that beam of wood is fairly strong, has a load bearing yeah. capacity. Yeah. But you don't do that consciously. But what he says is you have a subpersonal consciousness or subpersonal cognition of it that informs your personal cognition, i.e., you see the beam of wood without thinking about how strong it is, but the subpersonal cognition has informed your personal cognition. No. Because subpersonal com sub sub uh, uh, cognition is not part of that. You say yes, you it is. You will not know that because yeah. you're not aware of that computation. The reason I'm pointing to that is that my friend, when, because we have exactly this kind of debate in our class, and so my friend, who, is, who knows a lot more about cognitive science than I do, uh, say, well, why should we think that this stimuli that we are not able to attend to are in consciousness. They are in the subpersonal, what you call subpersonal sub cognition. Non conscious cognition, right? No, it's conscious, it's just not reported to the person. Well, that's what would the whole debate with, whether it's conscious or unconscious, and therefore still able to influence behavior, right? My friend who defends this view thinks, why do we think it's in consciousness? It's just able to influence despite not being in consciousness, whereas I would argue, uh, no, it is probably in consciousness, but we're not able 
to report it. In your reading, there is a, the Sperling experiment, right? You want to draw it quickly? OK. OK, so this is an experiment done in the 60s, <laughs> and which is trying to test what we are talking about. And the test goes something like uh, you're given a very short time to look at that, and then you're told. Uh, OK, do you want me to do it? Yeah. So the test goes like this. You will be shown something like this. What it says here doesn't matter. For uh, like a second. Then this gets covered. And then they say to you, what was on line number one? Or what was on line number two? Now, if I ask you the question within a second or two, you can actually report whichever line I ask you. But if I wait more than 10 or 20 seconds, and I hide it, then you will not be able to report when I ask you what was on line one, two, or three. So the, this is a classic attention experiment. What it says is all of this will stay in your consciousness yeah. for a very short span of time, like a second or two. And then it will be, because you haven't recalled it, it will leak away and will be, you will not be able to recall it. OK. It's different if I do words like, if I do things like this, yeah. and, uh, and like that. Yeah. <laughs> so this, this is one of the experiment that people like me, back to hold to think. Yes? Aren't there experiments with hypnosis that show that you can then recall this, you know, so for example, this experiment, you might be able to recall under hypnosis? I'm not aware of that, but uh, it yeah, could be. Are. Yeah, OK. Mm. OK. If you have some material, I, uh, I, I love to get that. So <laughs> uh, I guess it's time to conclude. So the problem of consciousness, right? Uh, this is what we are going to talk from next time. Adopting this, what I call, phenomenal field view, right? Why is it a problem? Well, because if you hold that view, you're holding a view which seems to imply that notion like objects, like representations, are not going to be able to capture consciousness. OK? This view, if you, on the other hand, basically, you can understand consciousness using this concept, like apprehending an object, holding a representation, right? These are standard terms in cognitive science, and they allow you to, un to unpack what consciousness is. In this view, in a way, there is no consciousness. There is just attention, and that's what we call consciousness. In this other view, which has some resonance in the Buddhist tradition, think about idea of citta, for example, not as synonymous with vijnana, but as citta, like in pure consciousness and so on. Uh, also, maybe a notion like bhavanga and so on. Ignore me. Yeah. This idea of consciousness is not going to be explainable in terms of just holding an object, right? Because we decided that in that view, there is more to consciousness than what we can hold as an object, right? And so the question is then, well, what is this consciousness if it's not just a mere apprehension of the object? That's a hard problem 
one way to understand what David Chalmers called the hard problem of consciousness, right? The hard problem of consciousness is to try to, un to understand a sense of consciousness which is not reducible to notions such as apprehension of a, an object holding a representation and so on. And so if it's not that, then what is it? Well, people will say monitoring. Okay, what is monitoring? Is it just looking, looking, looking? That's one way to understand why the problem of consciousness is difficult because the notion that we have, which are kind of object-based, might not do the job that we need to do. Another way to think about the problem is to realize that to understand consciousness, to understand subjectivity, we need to think not just about the objective pole of the experience, but the subjective pole of the experience, right? Now, what is the subjective pole of the experience? Well, if it's not, well, some people will say, tell you, it's just another representation. And then there are questions whether this open an infinite regress or not, right? That will come up in the phenomenal Yeah, that will come up. But if we don't hold that it's a set of representations, then what is the subject that is, uh, 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 that is, what is the subjective pole of experience, right? If it's not a set of representations. This is another way to think about the hard problem of consciousness. So what I've been explaining to you today is why there is maybe a hard problem of consciousness and how, uh, uh, how we can understand it by making, by distinguishing these two views of consciousness. One is a gatekeeper view, one is the phenomenal field. The word phenomenal refers to the phenomenal dimension of consciousness which is the how it is for me to undergo particular experience. Uh, Sartre talks about uh, consciousness as the for me, right? Meaning it's not just a set of objects that is happening, but it's something that is happening for somebody. And so that sense, that's what phenomenal mean. Phenomenal consciousness is a dimension of consciousness, or is consciousness understood in terms of how is it for me, for the organism, to undergo a particular experience. That comes from Thomas Nagel's uh, famous article, what it, is to be like, what it is like to be a bat. And the important point about this article is not whether it's possible or impossible to understand what it is to be, what it is like to be a bat. That's not the main point. The main point is that what is difficult to understand is what it is to be like anybody. Because what it is like to be is not the same that the particular object that we are holding in our consciousness. That's why we talk about phenomenal consciousness, right? And so in this second view, the argument is that the phenomenal content of consciousness is not the same as the content of consciousness we are attending to, that there is an overflow between the field of attention and the field of, if you want to call, phenomenality, right? Yeah, but an overflow which way? Is it going from the field into the object or from the object? There is more in the phenomenal field than in the object. So the object's overflowing into the phenomenal field? Yes. Or the phenomenal no. field is overflowing into Well, it, it actually works both ways, but yeah, which from the object to the field. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, we are going to do that by trying to talk about 
two approaches to the study of consciousness. The first person perspective, and that's where phenomenology is going to get in. And we're going to try to think about how the first person perspective connects to the third person perspective of cognitive science, psychology, and so on. And that's one way that we are trying to get some headway into understanding consciousness. Because you may think, well, what about brain science? What about this wonderful fMRI picture in which you have all these wonderful colors and so on? Well, the answer is that uh, these wonderful pictures are obviously wonderful technological achievement. They're also important in understanding the anatomy of the brain, but they don't tell us very much about consciousness because, uh, well, what does a picture tell you? Well, actually, it turns out not so much. Uh, and they obviously all kind of limitation to fMRI. They have time limitation. They have all kinds of things that we would need to talk about fMRI because when you read an article in the paper about Oh, now we have the God, uh, what's that? The God, God neuron. Yeah, God neuron. It's total BS. Don't believe a word of that. Uh, it's much, it's so complicated. The brain has about 80 billion neurons. Each neuron may have up to several thousand connections. And then there are 100 billion glial cells, which we have really not any idea of what they are doing. So this is, how complicated it is. And it's also the case that we don't have direct access to the brain, right? Cannot open a, uh, a head and look at the brain. So, uh, so we'll need to think different. We cannot just wait for brain science to tell us what consciousness is, because we might have to wait a long time, like three incalculable eons might be even short. But we have to try to proceed differently. And one way to think about it is by looking very systematically into experience and trying to connect it with some of the data of cognitive science and psychology. And that's a program for the next, what, three or four times? Yeah. OK. Yes? When you teach this class with a cognitive scientist. Yes, my defend, friend Joe. Does he defend the gatekeeper theory? And do you <laughs> debate it? Yes. Yes. Because I, I noticed you, you didn't defend it as strong as you No, no, because I am going to do a course on that. So, yeah, yeah, no, we do debate that. Because he's not here, that's why. Yeah. Well, we have only five classes, right? But yeah, we do debate that. Can I draw a distinction? When we talk about computational processes, <laughs> one idea is that when we perceive something like seeing, we're going to somehow compute that before it's presented to consciousness. A second form of computational process is what we would do deliberately in terms of thinking about something. And you raised the example earlier about doing sums, etc. And that's a conscious oh, computational yeah. yes, process yes. as opposed to non-conscious. Yes. But for the, for the conscious computational processes, uh, we have two, two models. One is uh, if we compare to playing chess, we have a chess computer that will crunch out the numbers and play brilliant chess, and that's called Stockfish. There is a new chess computer by Google, uh, which is called AlphaZero, and this works purely on pattern recognition rather uh -huh. than crunching numbers. And these are two ways that actually the human brain uses both. But well, we don't know. We, do. we can. We well, can. in explicit computation, but not in. in. So the uh, just recently, the Alpha Zero, that is the AI uh, that uses pattern recognition, has been launched in a series of chess games against the world's best chess computer. The Alpha Zero was given four hours to learn chess by itself, knowing only the rules. And Stockfish has been programmed in the last 25 years and has been improved. And in games which Stockfish reports as being exactly even, uh, AlphaZero has managed to beat it within 10 more moves. 
So pattern recognition in computers uh, has really taken off mm -hmm. and has shown itself better in many circumstances than crunching numbers. As far as I know, the human brain has been shown to do both. I can work out 67 times 1.4 computationally in my mind. I can also form patterns, like I know what five sixes are. Yeah, the, it out. So the, the human brain has both systems. What is difficult to know is what happened uh, in the non-explicit computation. Right. right? That's that's what we. Or it's presented to. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. Uh, yes. So but uh, you're right, pattern recognition is actually a lot closer to the hu how the human brain probably functions. Yes? You need to have attention first. You need to what? The, 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 I mean, the you, you're talking about these two views? Yeah. What yes. Do I need, uh, for the second view. Yes. When there is no attention, can we say that is the consciousness on the perceptual processing? So it's like you aware, you you conscious that you processing. Well, so the question for people who can't hear the yeah. question, he's saying, what's he what's he asking? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to understand. So can repeat. You, like, for the second view, can we can we say that it's the conscious that that conscious the perceptual processing? It's like you conscious that you processing. So I so he's asking, are you conscious in this view? Are you conscious that you are processing something, or is that processing going on without conscious awareness? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Okay. Well, perceptual processing happened. <coughs> way before you start to be conscious, right? What is the difference is whether... No, at before you're conscious of the object. You're yeah, 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 sure. Uh, thank you. You're right. Actually, that's an important distinction. We're talking about the consciousness of an object, right? Perceptual processing happens before you become aware that you're conscious. No question about that. The, the difference between the two is whether consciousness comes before attention or attention comes before consciousness. That's the, very simply the difference, right? Meaning that if consciousness comes before attention, then you have more in consciousness what we can attend to. That's why it's called the common sense model, because that's what we believe commonsensically, I believe that I see the rich uh, world and that I choose to attend to some features of this world, right? So, for example, if you're reading a book and someone says your name, yes. your conscious field is able to pick up that someone said your name, even though your attentive field is on the book. Yes, yes. Your attention is on the book, and then, well, your name maybe, but suppose, for example, uh, I talk to you, and you, or, or rather, you talk to me, and then suddenly I see somebody I am familiar with. Okay, now my attention is going to be drawn by that person. Now, in my consciousness, I will kind of hear what you are saying, because. I still hear sounds, but probably what will happen is that I will not be able to understand what you're saying, and then I will ask you, sorry, what did you say? I told you this the other day, and you said, no, no, I can do two things at once. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> well, you can, there are cases in which you can do two things. I am special. <laughs> didn't you know that? <laughs> Actually, it turns out that research on um, multitasking uh, has shows that we are very poor at multitasking. So uh, I'm probably not that different. So in my example, I am uh, hearing you, right? But I don't understand what you say because I'm looking at that person there who is a good friend of mine, right? 
In that example, my attention is over there. That's a foreground of my consciousness, right? In the background, there are a lot of things, according to this view, right? There are a lot of things. Among those, your words, they're not in the foreground, they're in the background, right? But I would say they are in my consciousness. Why they are in my consciousness? Because I can recall them. I, I, I can recall that I heard some words. I have no idea what you said, but I have this vague memory that you said something, right? So this is the second view, right? The second view holds that there is more in consciousness than what we can attend to. OK? The first view, say, no, BS. This is my friend, Joe. No, you, you don't hear this word. They're not in your consciousness. You just recreate that out of your understanding of the kind of conversational situation. But you, they were not in your consciousness. You kind of retroject them in the, in the past, but they were never there. That's a second, the gatekeeper view. Next question. Do you, does that help? Yes. I know when you often use the same word, consciousness, to talk about the gatekeeper view and the phenomenon. Yes. But the predominant meaning has also influenced us. The predominant view, the computational view. Yes. That has influenced, so the word perception, awareness, consciousness are really in a way, been shaped by the computational, representational view of consciousness. Would you say, even the word perception, for example, you can have a precognitive perception or not? So that challenges the whole computational view. Well, in a way. In a way, not. So, in, in the second view of consciousness, there's a lot of perception that's happening that is almost, one would say, precognition. Yeah. In the, in the yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, in a way I share your view, but uh, since I have to have to impersonate my friend, uh, he would say, okay, uh, precognitive, that works, but what makes you believe that they're part of consciousness? What not just say, this is outside of consciousness, though it influences consciousness, right? That's a debate that we have, right? So, yes, you're right. You're also right that a lot of our views about consciousness are heavily influenced by this computational model, which is kind of but the overwhelming... What is a mentation is different to... But, uh, use use Pali word, please. Manuel uh, Tam. Things that you do with your brain yeah. are different to vijnana, which is what you are conscious of. Yeah, I think I agree. Uh, I think there are notions in the in Buddhist which do work with this view, right? Yeah, I agree. I, I think we share the same view on that, but yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a, there's two things I want to bring up here. One is. Uh, the idea of uh, the brain yeah, and consciousness, uh, and also uh, the idea of consciousness without a brain. There's, and that's, that's one idea. Does, does consciousness happen without a brain, or just with a brain, or both? OK. And then the other idea, maybe it's connected to this idea of collective consciousness. Is that related to, to uh, the Sorry, the people that didn't hear the question, the first question is, uh, how is consciousness related to the brain? Can you have consciousness without the brain? Uh, can you have a brain without consciousness? Right. Obviously, George will say his students in his university have brains without consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> but can you have consciousness without a brain? Is the first Actually, question. they're pretty smart, so I would never say that. <laughs> <laughs> they also... In that course, they're also most cognitive, they're cognitive science students, so they know a lot more than I do, so I have to be really careful. Uh, okay. 
finish one more thing. The idea is that uh, when a person is alive, that's what okay, it. yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the short answer, no idea, no clue. <laughs> That's a short answer. Now let me elaborate uh, what I mean. What I'm trying to do in this course is try to think how modern Buddhists could think about consciousness in an age where brain science and computers and AI are just completely transforming our world, right? Now, in that kind of world, Talking about consciousness without a brain is really difficult because the question is going to be, well, what is the relation between your immaterial consciousness and the brain? And this is a question that has been asking to all dualists and nobody has able, as far as I know, to give a convincing answer of uh, what is the relation between an immaterial consciousness and a brain, right? Very difficult. Now, there are metaphors like uh, the brain is like a radio station and uh, the consciousness is like the radio wave that are coming. It's a nice metaphor, but I'm not sure it helps really in terms of if you understand a little bit how the cognition works, like, for example, vision, like the three steps uh, in the process of vision, that doesn't really help us to understand consciousness. So, as a result, most people assume that, no, there is no consciousness without brain. Now, when you are actually trying to explain what is the relation between the brain and consciousness, nobody has really a good answer either, because any answer that you give, that I know of, has some hope. So this is why in this course, I'm not going to answer, this, answer that question because I don't think we can ask, answer that question. What we can do is in a way creep up on consciousness by looking at not so much the brain because we have such a long way to go to understand how the brain really works, but by looking at first person perspective and some of the finding in cognitive science, psychology, and so on, and try to see how these two intersect or don't. Now, is this going to provide the answer to your question? No. Is this going to provide uh, a full account of consciousness? No. But it is going to give us some interesting idea about what we should work towards. And that's, I think, where we are. Right? But it may also be that there's more to consciousness than just the brain. It, it could be. The whole it's, organism. So they found, they found there's a... Oh, yeah, from, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. From the heart to the brain. Yeah, the, yes, yes. Embodied consciousness, the role of the body, and so on. Hopefully we'll have some time to talk about that. That's obvious. I thought you meant non-material consciousness, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. I, I, that's how I understood your question. There's a brief answer. Uh, this question on collective consciousness. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have. Uh, I really had no idea. Uh, in my way of understanding, I think socialization is probably the best way to understand collective consciousness, that is, representations that are held collectively and that are transmitted through education, through various process of socialization. That's my way to understand, but there might be more than that, but I really don't know. Uh, we're going, to, we're going to finish in six minutes, so it's oh, yeah. a short question and short answers. I just want to, back to the previous question. I thought it was, can you have consciousness without a brain? I can, understood your answer to say, we don't know what the connection is between Consciousness in your brain, there are many possibilities. Yes. But you didn't answer that whether we could have consciousness in lieu of a brain. What do you mean? Well, I answered because I said I don't know what the connection is between the two. So we don't know. What? Uh, yeah, we don't know. So that's my short answer. Uh, David Chalmers uh, has become a pan psychist, right? 
And that's one of the answers to, uh, to uh, the relation between the brain and uh, the body, arguing that everything material has a consciousness aspect, right? So this is one of the views. I find this totally unsatisfactory, but I couldn't provide you a view that answers really all the important questions. So that, that view would mean I can just let other people learn stuff for me? Hopefully it wouldn't mean that. <laughs> but you're still presupposing there's a consciousness and brain, and there's some relationship. Well, there are people who say, no, there is no difference, but then there are certain problems to that view. There are people who say there is a... So, any view you have on the relation between brain and consciousness and uh, consciousness is going to have problems. My own favorite view is that of Spinoza, which is a double aspect view, but the view that to me makes the most sense, which is that there are two ways we understand the same thing. That's my own favorite view, but I would not say that this view answers all the questions, either, for example, the question about mental causation that are kind of delicate to resolve. So, yeah, next question. Yes, please. So I just wanted to clarify something before. So you were discussing the personal and subpersonal processing. Yes. And so you said there was a gatekeeper view point. And like I'm not too excited. You can have consciousness, right? Yeah. Indefinable in the way that we're talking about it now. You're using the word a lot, but yes. I agree there's a big cloud. Well, no, no. We use the word consciousness here is phenomenal consciousness. Yeah. What it is like for me to undergo the experience. Now you would say, this is kind of fuzzy. Right, so there's yes. Right? Yeah. But then it is possible to have subpersonal cognition and then personal cognition that are building upon yes. consciousness itself, right? So yes. that's not necessarily a gatekeeper view. No. Point. No. no. Yeah. Yeah. Except that the gatekeeper would kind of go to that answer more quickly, but it's right. not connected. Both of you are totally agree that there is a subpersonal level and a personal level. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting because it's been, yeah, you can't, so that means you're saying that you cannot describe consciousness by referring to this concept of processing and subpersonal processing. Like subpersonal processing is able to process objects, for example. Yes. But conscious, when we talk about consciousness, we cannot rely on those kind of descriptions. Of I am not sure where you're going, but where I would quickly uh, is that the difference between these two views is not whether there is subpersonal processing or not. The difference is how you draw the limits, the boundary between the two. Is it attention that draws a boundary, or is there something below attention which is already personal uh, processing, but not yet? Yeah. Yeah, not yet reported. That's a difference. That's why the second view is very comfortable talking about various levels or states of consciousness as being more or less conscious, whereas to me the gatekeeper view is, could be pushed towards saying either you're conscious or you're not. And then there are all kind of intermediary states like hypnosis and so on, where it might be difficult to answer exactly whether you're conscious or not, right? Yeah. Yes? On the question of consciousness without a brain, how about hive consciousness, a beehive or an ant colony? Okay. What? Oh, okay. Uh, I really don't know. The question was what about... Yeah, no, it's... Which is the same as collective consciousness. Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting. For example, uh, yeah, animal cognition is a very important topic and there is a lot of work being done. And some people are working on insects and uh, this kind of, uh, of animals. And I'm not quite sure I understand what motivates this animal, whether it's a kind of personal survival or the survival of the collectivity. Because, for example, I'm not sure whether bees, for example, have pain receptors or not. Some people seem to think that maybe bees don't uh, feel pain, 
that actually there is what kind of makes them tick might be something like a collective sense rather than this individual drive to survive, which is clearly at work in mammals and birds, right? So I don't know. This is all very interesting and difficult questions. In one minute it, or less, can you tell us what we're looking at next week? Yes. We are looking at doing phenomenology, understanding what the word phenomenology means and why is phenomenology useful to understand the first-person perspective. And we'll do that in two classes and talk, so, talk also about the self. And after that, in class uh, four, we'll talk about consciousness and actions. And if there is time, we'll talk about consciousness and emotions. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Josh. Thank you very much. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, there's no charge for this film, but.